Chapter 10 of the Migration of Birds by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Geographic Patterns of Migration Populations Within Species Both length and duration of migratory journeys vary greatly between families, species, or populations within a species northern bobwhite and other north american quails northern cardinals canyon cactus and carolina wrens wren tits some of the titmouses and most woodpeckers are largely non-migratory these species may live out their entire existence without going more than ten miles from the nest where they were hatched song sparrows eastern and western meadowlarks and blue jays make such short migrations that the movement is difficult to detect because individuals possibly not the same ones may be found in one area throughout the year while other individuals that move south may be replaced by individuals from the north information on movements of these partial migrant species can be gained by observing birds that are banded or color marked the american robin for example occurs in the southern united states throughout the year but only during the summer in canada and alaska its movements are readily ascertained from museum specimens the breeding robin of the southeastern states is the southern race in autumn most of the more northern nesters such as those from maryland and virginia move into the southern part of the breeding range or slightly further south at about the same time the northern american robin moves south and winters throughout the breeding and wintering range of its smaller and paler southern relative thus there is complete overlap of wintering ranges of northern and southern american robin populations although some individuals of the northern race winter in areas vacated earlier by the southern race among many migratory species there is considerable variation among individuals and populations with respect to distances moved certain populations may be quite sedentary while others are strongly migratory and certain individuals in the same population can be more migratory than others for example red-winged blackbirds nesting on the gulf coast are practically sedentary but in winter they are joined by other subspecies that nest as far north as the mackenzie valley in certain populations of song sparrows males remain all year in their northern breeding grounds while the females and young migrate south in dark-eyed juncos adult females migrate the furthest south while young males winter the furthest north adult male and young female juncos winter at intermediate distances several species containing more than one distinguishable population exhibit leapfrog migration patterns the eastern population of the fox sparrow breeds from northeastern manitoba to labrador but during the winter it is found concentrated in the southeastern part of the united states on the west coast of the continent however a study of museum specimens indicated six subspecies of this bird breeding in rather sharply delimited ranges extending from puget sound and vancouver island to unimac island at the end of the alaskan peninsula one of these subspecies breeds from the puget sound vancouver island area northward along the coast of british columbia it hardly migrates at all while the other races nesting on the coast of alaska are found in winter far to the south in oregon and california although much overlap exists 
the races breeding furthest north generally tend to winter furthest south this illustrates a tendency for migratory populations to pass over those subspecies so favorably located as to be almost sedentary if the northern birds settle for the winter along with the sedentary population winter requirements may not be as sufficient as in the unoccupied areas further south among the differentially sized subspecies of canada geese the populations of lowest body mass breed the furthest north but winter the furthest south while the heaviest subspecies is a relatively permanent resident in the northern united states this pattern is clearly related to the increased survival under cold stress afforded by large body size the palm warbler breeds from nova scotia and maine west and northwest to the southern mackenzie river valley the species has been separated into two subspecies those breeding in the interior of canada and those breeding in the northeastern united states and canada the northwestern subspecies makes a three thousand mile journey from great slave lake to the west indies and central america moving through the gulf states early in october after the bulk of these birds has passed the eastern subspecies whose migratory journey is about half as long drifts slowly into the gulf coast region and remains for the winter short distance migration some species have extensive summer ranges for instance the pine warbler rock wren field sparrow loggerhead shrike and black-headed grosbeak and concentrate during the winter season in the southern part of the breeding range or occupy additional territory only a short distance further south the entire species may thus be confined within a restricted area during winter but with the return of warmer weather the species spreads out to reoccupy the much larger summer range many species including the american tree sparrows snow buntings and lapland long spurs nest in the far north and winter in the eastern united states while others including the vesper and chipping sparrows common grackle red-winged blackbird eastern bluebird american woodcock and several species of ducks nest much further south in the united states and canada and move south a relatively short distance for the winter to areas along the gulf of mexico in a few of the more hardy species individuals may linger in protected areas well within the regions of severe cold the common snipe for example is frequently found during sub-zero weather in parts of the rocky mountain region where warm springs assure a food supply long distance migration more than 300 breeding species leave the United States and Canada and spend the winter in the West Indies, Central America, or South America. For example, the Cape May Warbler breeds from northern New England, northern Michigan, and northern Minnesota north to New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and nearly to Great Slave Lake in winter it is concentrated chiefly in the west indies on the island of hispaniola some of the common summer residents of north america migrate even further pushing across the equator and finally coming to rest for the winter on the argentine pampas or in patagonia common nighthawks barn swallows cliff swallows and thrushes may occupy these same general winter quarters in brazil but other night hawks and barn swallows go further south of all north american land birds whose species probably travel the furthest 
they are found north in summer to the yukon territory and alaska and south in winter to argentina seven thousand miles away such seasonal flights are exceeded in length however by the remarkable journeys of several species of shore birds including white rumped and baird's sandpipers greater yellow legs ruddy turnstones red knots and sanderlings in this group nineteen species breed north of the arctic circle and winter in south america six of these go as far south as patagonia a distance of over eight thousand miles the arctic tern is the champion globe trotter and long distance flyer its name arctic is well earned as its breeding range is circumpolar and it nests as far north as the land extends in north america the first nest found in this region was only seven and one half degrees five hundred eighteen miles from the north pole and contained a downy chick surrounded by a wall of newly fallen snow scooped out by the parent in north america the arctic tern breeds south in the interior to great slave lake and on the atlantic coast south to massachusetts after the young are grown arctic terns disappear from their north american breeding grounds and turn up a few months later in the antarctic region eleven thousand miles away for a long time the route followed by these hardy flyers was a mystery although a few scattered individuals had been noted south as far as long island in the united states the species is otherwise practically unknown along the atlantic coasts of north america and northern south america it is however a migrant on the west coast of europe and africa as a result of band recoveries its migratory pattern was disclosed few other animals in the world enjoy as many hours of daylight as the arctic tern for these birds the sun shines most of the day during the nesting season in the northern part of the range and during their winter sojourn to the south daylight is almost continuous as well End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Migration of Birds by the U. S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Orientation and Navigation Factors in a Bird's Environment Select for the Expression of Migratory Behavior, Leading to the Evolution of a Migratory Pattern, or, on the other hand, to the loss of migratory abilities factors in the environment function to provide direct proximal stimulation for the physiological preparation for migration factors in the environment also provide information that allows birds to navigate during migratory passage navigation requires knowing three things current location destination and the direction to travel to get from the current location to the destination humans eventually learn to use both the sun and the stars to obtain this information recently we invented more precise satellite-based technologies that have made these celestial cues for determining geographic positions superfluous and developed electronic aids to navigation that allow orientation without reference to the natural environment birds have successfully navigated for eons using environmental information birds are not alone in their ability to navigate long distances fish mammals and even insects make migratory journeys but the clarion honking of geese moving in huge skeins across the vault of the heavens 
the twittering of migrants filtering down out of the night sky the flocks of newly arrived birds filling woodlands fields and mudflats makes us most aware of the seasonal movements of birds and fills us with awe and wonder as to how such a magnificent event can be accomplished season after season year after year with such unerring precision of the three kinds of information necessary for navigation we know something about the environmental cues that birds use to orient their migratory flight in the proper direction on the other hand there also is well-supported experimental evidence that birds use neither the positions of the sun or the stars to know where they are or where they are to go it has been shown however that birds must learn both the location of the wintering area as well as the location of the breeding area in order to navigate properly but we have no idea what information they are learning nor do we know what cues birds use to know the location of their migratory destination when they are in their wintering locale often thousands of miles away the recapture of banded birds at the same places along the route of the migratory journey in subsequent years suggests that some species also learn the location of traditional stopover sites but how they do that remains a mystery vector navigation european starlings pass through holland on their migration from sweden finland and northwestern russia to their wintering grounds on the channel coast of france and the southern british isles Perdick transported thousands of starlings from the hague to switzerland releasing these banded birds in a geographic location in which the population had never had any previous experience the subsequent recapture of many of these banded birds demonstrated that the adults which had previously made the migratory flight knew they had been displaced and returned to their normal wintering range by flying a direction approximately ninety degrees to their usual southwesterly course the juveniles which had never made the trip before in contrast continued to fly southwest and were recaptured on the iberian peninsula these first-year birds knew what direction to fly but did not recognize they had been displaced thus ending up in a atypical wintering range in subsequent years these now adult birds returned to again winter in spain and portugal coupled with another displacement of starlings to the barcelona coast in spain Perdick concluded that the proper direction of the migratory flight was innate that is inherited in their d n a since the naive juveniles could fly that direction and that the birds were also genetically programmed to fly a set distance this is the same vector or dead reckoning navigation program Lindbergh used to fly from new york to paris by maintaining a given compass direction or directions for a predetermined time that is distance but this study demonstrated that this navigation system is modified by experience since adults knew they were not in holland any longer and knew that in order to get to their normal wintering grounds they needed to fly a direction that they had never flown before these results are truly amazing and we don't know how they did it displacement studies in the western hemisphere using several species of buntings also demonstrated that birds recognized they had been moved and could fly appropriate yet unique routes to return to their normal range yet adult hooded crows transported latitudinally by over six hundred kilometers from wintering grounds in the eastern baltic 
to northwestern germany failed to recognize this displacement in the spring they oriented properly but migrated to sweden west of their normal breeding range this species used vector navigation but did not know the location of its traditional destination since it is generally accepted that migratory behavior evolved independently again and again in different bird populations a single explanation to fit all cases perhaps should not be expected orientation cues most of the effort applied to understanding how birds make a migratory flight has been directed toward environmental cues that birds use to maintain a particular flight direction these cues are landmarks on the earth's surface the magnetic lines of flux that longitudinally encircle the earth both the sun and the stars in the celestial sphere arching over the earth and perhaps prevailing wind direction and odors landmarks are useful as a primary navigation reference only if the bird has been there before for cranes swans and geese that migrate in family groups young of the year could learn the geographic map for their migratory journey from their parents but most birds do not migrate in family flocks and on their initial flight south to the wintering range or back north in the spring must use other cues yet birds are aware of the landscape over which they are crossing and appear to use landmarks for orientation purposes radar images of migrating birds subject to a strong crosswind were seen to drift off course except for flocks migrating parallel to a major river these birds used the river as a reference to shift their orientation and correct for drift in order to maintain the proper ground track that major geographic features like point pelee jutting into lake erie or cape may at the tip of new jersey are meccas for bird watchers only reflects the fact that migrating birds recognize these peninsulas during their migration migrating hawks seeking updrafts along the north shore of lake superior or the ridges of the appalachians must pay attention to the terrain below them in order to take advantage of the energetic savings afforded by these topographic structures since humans learn to use celestial cues it was only natural that studies were undertaken to demonstrate that birds could use them as well soon after the end of the second world war gustav kramer showed that migratory european starlings oriented to the azimuth of the sun when he used mirrors to shift the sun's image by ninety degrees in the laboratory and obtained a corresponding shift in the bird's orientation furthermore since the birds would maintain a constant direction even though the sun traversed from east to west during the day the compensation for this movement demonstrated that the birds were keeping time they knew what orientation to the sun was appropriate at 9 a.m they knew what different angle was appropriate at noon and again at 4 p.m it has been recently shown that melatonin secretions from the light sensitive pineal gland on the top of the bird's brain are involved in this response not only starlings but homing pigeons penguins waterfowl and many species of perching birds have been shown to use solar orientation even nocturnal migrants take directional information from the sun european robins and savannah sparrows that were prevented from seeing the setting sun did not orient under the stars as well as birds that were allowed to see the sun set birds can detect polarized light from sunlight's penetration through the atmosphere 
and it has been hypothesized that the pattern of polarized light in the evening sky is the primary cue that provides a reference for their orientation using the artificial night sky provided by planetariums demonstrated that nocturnal migrants respond to star patterns quite analogous to kramer's work on solar orientation france sauer demonstrated that if the planetarium sky is shifted the birds make a corresponding shift in their orientation azimuth steve emlin was able to show that the orientation was not dependent upon a single star like polaris but to the general sky pattern as he would turn off more and more stars so that they were no longer being projected in the planetarium the bird's orientation became poorer and poorer while the proper direction for orientation at a given time is probably innate emlin was able to show that knowing the location of north must be learned when young birds were raised under a planetarium sky in which betelgeuse a star in orion of the southern sky was projected to the celestial north pole the birds oriented as if betelgeuse was north when they were later placed under the normally oriented night sky even though in reality it was south radar studies have shown that birds do migrate above cloud decks where landmarks are not visible under overcast skies where celestial cues are not visible and even within cloud layers where neither set of cues is available the nomadic horsemen of the steppes of asia used the response of lodestones to the earth's magnetic field to find their way and the hypothesis that migrating birds might do the same was suggested as early as the middle of the nineteenth century yet it was not until the mid twentieth century that merkel and wilchko demonstrated in a laboratory environment devoid of any other cues that european robins would change their orientation in response to shifts in an artificial magnetic field that was as weak as the earth's natural field although iron containing magnetite crystals are associated with the nervous system in homing pigeons northern bob white and several species of perching birds it is unknown whether they are associated with the sensory receptor for the geomagnetic cue an alternate hypothesis for the sensory receptor suggests that response of visual pigments in the eye to electromagnetic energy is the basis for geomagnetic orientation it has been shown however that previous exposure to celestial orientation cues enhances the ability of a bird to respond more appropriately when only geomagnetic cues are available radar observations indicate that birds will decrease their airspeed when their ground speed is augmented by a strong tail wind we also know that birds can sense wind direction as gusts ruffling the feathers stimulate sensory receptors located in the skin around the base of the feather since there are characteristic patterns of wind circulation around high and low pressure centers at the altitude most birds migrate it has been hypothesized that birds could use these prevailing wind directions as an orientation cue however there presently is no experimental support for this hypothesis the sense of smell in birds was considered for a long time to be poorly developed but more recent evidence suggests that some species can discriminate odors quite well if the olfactory nerves of homing pigeons are cut the birds do not return to their home loft as well as birds whose olfactory nerves were left intact a similar experiment has demonstrated that 
european starlings with severed olfactory nerves returned less often than unaffected control birds even at distances as great as two hundred and forty kilometers from their home roosts and even more interesting when these starlings were returned to the nesting area the following spring the starlings with non-functioning olfactory nerves returned at a significantly lower frequency than the other starlings considering the array of demonstrated and suggested cues that birds might use in their orientation it is clear that they rely upon a suite of cues rather than a single cue for a migrating bird this redundancy is critical since not all sources of orientation information are equally available at a given time nor are all sources of information equally useful in a given situation end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the migration of birds by the u s fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain influence of weather weather especially temperature affects the rate of pre-migratory preparation a warmer earlier spring accelerates the process while a cooler later spring inhibits the process for example the maintenance of body temperature under cold stress competes for energy that might be stored as fat in preparation for the migratory journey if temperatures were a little more salubrious additionally there might be a more direct response from temperature receptors in the skin that direct impulses to the areas of the brain that regulate hormonal factors affecting the development of the migratory state thus in warm early springs a species arrives earlier than average while in cool late springs they tend to arrive later during both spring and fall migrations radar studies have demonstrated that weather has a defining role in determining when a bird will actually begin a migratory flight the primary stimulus for departure is a following wind in the spring this is a wind from the south in the fall it is a wind from the north clear skies presumably providing for celestial orientation cues are of secondary importance since major flights will occur under an overcast if adequate tailwinds are blowing in the north temperate zone migrations are concurrent with periods of rapid seasonal change in the summer warm moist air masses dominate but as fall approaches colder drier air pushes southward to eventually bring the grip of winter to the land the battle for domination of air masses is then reversed in the spring as the longer day lengths increase the heat load in the atmosphere again giving the advantage to the northward expansion of warmer air it is along this frontal boundary between these air masses that low pressure centers develop and move eastward steered by the high velocity jet stream aloft winds flow in toward these low pressure centers in a counterclockwise circulation fed by air spiraling outward in a clockwise direction from intervening high pressure centers within the air masses thus in the southeastern quadrant of a low pressure center warm moist winds drive a warm front northward into the colder air the warmer air being pushed gradually above the colder air forming large areas of cloud cover and widespread rainfall in the northwestern quadrant of a low pressure center cold dry air pushes a cold front southeastward into the warmer air mass 
abruptly forcing the warm moist air aloft sometimes with violent and severe consequences since prevailing wind direction determines whether a migratory flight will occur the patterns of wind circulation around highs and lows affects migratory movement during fall migration the best passage of migrants usually occurs the day after the day of cold front passage with brisk north winds dropping temperatures a rising barometer and clearing skies the intensity of this flight only wanes as migrating flocks become less and less influenced by the prevailing winds following the cold front as it moves eastward since wind direction becomes more variable and wind velocity decreases as high pressure begins to dominate mass migratory flights are curtailed this is the time birds stop and feed during spring weather conditions in the southeastern or warm sector of a low pressure are conducive to movements of birds since the prevailing wind flows strongly from the south but when these migrating flocks are overtaken by the cold front sweeping in from the west with its abrupt reversal of wind direction towering clouds turbulent air and often torrential rain migration stops and the birds are grounded if northward migrating flocks overtake the warm front they are also faced with a shift in wind direction now blowing out of the east increased cloud cover and precipitation and since the air is less turbulent the wind shift less inappropriate and the rains gentler they will often continue northward a while before they land and begin to forage the passage of low pressure system and the associated winds often results in waves of migrants grounded by the storm being seen by observers this is especially the case in the spring this phenomenon reaches its superlative expression along the gulf of mexico if a cold front is positioned along or just off the coast then trance gulf migrants nearing the end of their flight from central america and enjoying the advantage of a following wind must struggle against the adverse headwinds until landfall is reached and the exhausted birds settle immediately to rest and forage in whatever habitat the coastal strand provides it is a day to be remembered by any bird watcher orioles and tanagers by the dozens crowd the scrubby seaside bushes blackburnian and cerulean warblers forage with indigo and painted buntings in the lawns of bayside homes but if there is no front there are no birds the migrants having sufficient fat stores to continue flying northward on the following wind until they must stop to eat and drink soaring birds such as hawks ospreys eagles and vultures are very dependent on proper wind conditions for migration in the fall often the best day to observe hawk migration along mountains in the eastern united states is on the second day after a cold front has passed providing there are steady northwest to west winds to produce updrafts as the strong air currents are forced over the north south oriented ridges migrants also soar on convective thermals that are generated by the differential heating of the earth's surface it has been estimated that the normal pre-migratory fat load of 100 grams in a broad-winged hawk would be exhausted in only five days of flapping flight but by spiraling in the updrafts of one thermal and gliding down to the next to again to take advantage of the rising air currents its stored fat would last 20 days more than enough to provide energy for its 3000 mile journey from the neotropics 
End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of the Migration of Birds by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Influence of Topography The relation of the world's land masses to each other and the distribution of ecological communities within these land masses influence the direction birds migrate topography may aid hinder or prevent the progress of a migrant depending on the bird's particular requirements old world migrants must contend with east and west trending mountain ranges and deserts and major migratory routes tend to be in a northeast to southwest or a northwest to southeast direction in order to circumnavigate these barriers in the new world however migrants can proceed north and south over the land unimpeded since the major mountain ranges and river systems are oriented in the same direction as the birds migration distinct features in the landscape including rivers mountain ridges desert rims or peninsulas appear to influence migratory travel by providing a landscape reference for orientation especially when it is necessary to compensate for wind drift large bodies of water constitute real barriers to soaring birds dependent on thermals since water temperatures are usually less than land temperatures during both vernal and autumnal migratory periods and thus are characterized by subsidence of air rather than updrafts the shoreline then may provide a guiding line since onshore winds rise upward once they move across the warmer land these conditions often concentrate broad-winged rough-legged red-shouldered and red-tailed hawks migrating through the great lakes into restricted areas where numbers observed can be spectacular it has been observed around lake ontario for example that maximum hawk flights occur when winds are from ten to twenty five miles per hour but when winds exceed thirty five miles per hour good soaring conditions are curtailed and hawk migration ceases similar conditions exist over the bosphorus between the black sea and the mediterranean where thousands of white storks eagles and buzzards can be observed on a good day for migrants not dependent upon soaring flight on the other hand large bodies of water do not affect their rate of migration or the routes they choose the gulf of mexico the mediterranean sea and even the open atlantic from the maritime provinces of canada to the northern coast of south america are regularly crossed by many songbirds as previously noted mountain ridges that parallel the line of flight offer updrafts to soaring birds the highest and longest ridges deflect the horizontal winds upward better than the shorter ridges less than one thousand feet high and more birds are seen on the average along these higher ridges in summary topography may help or deter a migrant in its passage it affects different birds in different ways in north america migratory movements are continent-wide and no evidence indicates any particular part of the landscape influences all birds in the same manner certain bird populations may use regular geographic routes during migration but they are usually not rigidly restricted to them because of topography end of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of the Migration of Birds by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
perils of migration migration is dangerous untold thousands of smaller migrants die each year from storms and attacks by predators indeed the passage of migrants is so reliable that eleonora's falcon breeds in the fall to take advantage of the many songbirds crossing the mediterranean as a source of food for its young mortality during migratory flight of course is one of the several costs that balance the increased production of offspring that migrants obtain by nesting in locations where food is more abundant and interspecific competition for most resources is lower storms of all the hazards confronting birds in migration storms are one of the most dangerous birds that cross broad stretches of water can confront headwinds associated with a storm become exhausted and fall into the waves such a catastrophe was once seen from the deck of a vessel in the gulf of mexico thirty miles off the mouth of the mississippi river great numbers of migrating birds chiefly warblers were nearing land after having accomplished nearly ninety five per cent of their long flight when caught by a norther against which they were unable to make headway hundreds were forced into the waters of the gulf and drowned a sudden drop in temperature accompanied by a snowfall can cause a similar effect aerial obstructions lighthouses tall buildings monuments television towers and other aerial obstructions have been responsible for destruction of migratory birds bright beams of lights on buildings and airport cilometers have a powerful attraction for nocturnal air travelers that may be likened to the fascination for lights exhibited by many insects particularly night flying moths the attraction is most noticeable on foggy nights when the rays have a dazzling effect that not only lures the birds but confuses them and causes their death by collision against high structures the fixed white stationary light located one hundred and eighty feet above sea level on ponce de leon inlet formerly mosquito inlet florida has caused great destruction of bird life even though the lens is shielded by wire netting two other lighthouses at the southern end of florida sombrero key and fowey rocks have been the cause of a great number of bird tragedies while heavy mortality has been noted also at some of the lights on the great lakes and on the coast of quebec fixed white lights seem to be most attractive to birds lighthouses equipped with flashing or red lights do not have the same attraction for many years in washington d c the illuminated washington monument towering more than five hundred and fifty five feet into the air caused destruction of large numbers of small birds batteries of brilliant floodlights grouped on all four sides around the base illuminate the monument so brilliantly airplane pilots noticed that it could be seen for forty miles on a clear night on dark nights with gusty northerly winds nocturnal migrants seem to fly at lower altitudes and are attracted to the monument as they mill about the shaft they are dashed against it by eddies of wind and hundreds have been killed in a single night in september nineteen forty eight bird students were startled by news of the wholesale destruction of common yellow throats american red starts oven birds and others against the one thousand two hundred and fifty foot empire state building in new york city the four hundred and ninety one foot philadelphia savings fund society building in philadelphia and the four hundred and fifty foot w b a l radio tower in baltimore in new york the birds continued to crash into the empire state building for six hours more recently 
television towers have become a major hazard these structures are so tall sometimes over one thousand feet they present a greater menace than buildings or lighthouses their blinking lights cause passing migrants to blunder into guy wires or the tower itself numerous instances throughout the united states indicate this peril to migration is widespread yet t v tower kills have been an excellent source of scientific information on the fat loads migrants carry since they literally remove birds from out of the sky during their migration exhaustion the american golden plover travels over a two thousand four hundred mile oceanic route from nova scotia to south america in about forty eight hours of continuous flight this is accomplished with the consumption of less than two ounces of body fat in contrast to be just as efficient in operation a one thousand pound airplane would consume only a single pint of fuel in a twenty mile flight rather than the gallon usually required similarly the tiny ruby-throated hummingbird weighing approximately four grams crosses the gulf of mexico in a single flight of more than five hundred miles while consuming less than a gram of fat one might expect the exertion required for long migratory flights would result in arrival of migrants at their destination near a state of exhaustion this is usually not the case birds that have recently arrived from a protracted flight over land or sea sometimes show evidences of being tired but their condition is far from being a state of exhaustion unless they have faced adverse winds in reality even small land birds are so little exhausted by ocean voyages they not only cross the gulf of mexico at its widest point but may even proceed without pause many miles inland before stopping the sora considered such a weak flyer that at least one writer was led to infer most of its migration was made on foot has one of the longest migration routes of any member of the rail family and even crosses the wide reaches of the caribbean sea observations indicate that under favorable conditions birds can fly when and where they please and the distance covered in a single flight is governed chiefly by the rate of dehydration and to a lesser degree the amount of stored fat end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the migration of birds by the fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain roots of migration general considerations while certain flight directions are consistently followed by migratory birds it is well to remember that the term migration route is a generalization a concept referring to the general movements of a species rather than an exact course followed by individual birds or a path followed by a species characterized by specific geographic or ecological boundaries even the records of banded birds usually show no more than the places of banding and recovery and the details of the route actually traversed between the two points is interpolated in determining migration routes one must also constantly guard against the false assumption that localities with many grounded migrants are on the main path of migration and localities where no migrants are observed are off the main path there is also considerable variation in the routes chosen by different species differences in distance traveled time of starting speed of flight latitudes of breeding and wintering grounds all contribute to this great variation of migration routes among species for example 
waterfowl banding data not only indicate species differences but also indicate considerable diversity in direction of movement by different breeding populations within a species as well as between individuals in the same population nevertheless there are certain factors that serve to guide individuals or groups of individuals along more or less regular paths and it is possible to define such lines of migration for many species flyways and corridors through plotting accumulated banding data obtained in the 1930s investigators became impressed by what appeared to be four broad relatively exclusive flyway belts in north america this concept based upon analyses of the several thousand records of migratory waterfowl recoveries then available led fred lincoln to conclude that because of the great attachment of migratory birds for their ancestral flyways it would be possible practically to exterminate the ducks of the west without seriously interfering with the supply of birds of the same species in the atlantic and mississippi flyways and that the birds of these species using the eastern flyways would be slow to overflow and repopulate the devastated areas of the west even though environmental conditions might be so altered as to be entirely favorable since 1948 this model has served as the basis for administrative action by the fish and wildlife service in setting annual migratory waterfowl hunting regulations the notion of bird populations being confined to four fairly definite and distinct migration flyways is probably most applicable to those birds that migrate in family groups namely geese swans and cranes but does not appear to be very helpful in understanding the movements of the more widely dispersing ducks or most other groups of birds young geese will tend to return to breed in the area in which they were hatched even though competition might be less in goose populations breeding in another flyway mating in many ducks occurs on the winter range and even though a male had come south on one flyway it will return with the female perhaps on a different flyway consequently vacant breeding areas are more rapidly repopulated by ducks than by geese although lincoln's analysis was confined to ducks and geese some thought that it applied to other groups of birds as well everyone now realizes that the concept of four flyways designated as the atlantic mississippi central and pacific flyways was an oversimplification of an extremely complex situation involving crisscrossing of migration routes that vary from species to species flyways can be considered meaningful only in a very general way even for waterfowl and not generally applicable to other groups of birds by determining relative abundances of dabbling ducks east of the rocky mountains frank bellrose of the illinois natural history survey presented a more realistic picture yet the four flyway areas have been useful in regionalizing the harvest of waterfowl for areas of different vulnerability to hunting pressure bellrose also mapped the corridors for the diving ducks and showed heavy traffic similar to that of dabbling species through the great plains and relatively heavily used corridors from these central arteries eastward across the great lakes area to the atlantic coast terminating particularly in the vicinity of chesapeake bay a fairly well used corridor also extends along the atlantic coast with our present knowledge of bird migration 
recognizing distinct broad belts of migration down the north american continent encompassing groups of different populations or species is not realistic about all we can say for sure now is that birds travel between certain breeding areas in the north and certain wintering areas in the south that a few heavily traveled corridors are used by certain species and that more generalized are routes followed by other species narrow routes some species exhibit extremely narrow routes of travel the red knot and purple sandpiper for example are normally found only along the coasts because they are limited on one side by the broad waters of the ocean and on the other by land and fresh water neither of these habitats furnish conditions attractive to these species the ipswich race of the savannah sparrow likewise has a very restricted migration range it is known to breed only on tiny sable island nova scotia and it winters from that island south along the atlantic coast to georgia it is rarely more than a quarter of a mile from the outer beach and is entirely at home among the sand dunes with sparse covering of coarse grass the harris sparrow provides an interesting example of a moderately narrow migration route in the interior of the country this handsome sparrow is known to breed only in the narrow belt of stunted timber and brush along the northern limit of trees from the vicinity of churchill on the west shore of hudson bay to the mackenzie delta one thousand six hundred miles to the northwest when this sparrow reaches the united states on its southward migration it is most numerous in a belt about five hundred miles wide between montana and central minnesota south through a relatively narrow path in the central part of the continent its winter range lies primarily from southeastern nebraska and northwestern missouri across eastern kansas and oklahoma and through a 150 mile wide section of eastern texas the habitat preference of harris's sparrows for the coniferous forest tundra transition on its breeding range also characterizes the structure of its habitat choice of shrubby patches within grasslands on its wintering range consequently its narrow migratory pathway is west of the eastern deciduous forest and even with deforestation the species has not widened its wintering area converging routes when birds start their southward migration the movement necessarily involves the full width of the breeding range later in the case of land birds with extensive breeding ranges there is a convergence of the lines of flight taken by individual birds owing in part to the conformation of the land mass and in part to the east-west restriction of habitats suitable to certain species an example of this is provided by the eastern kingbird which breeds in a summer range 2800 miles wide from newfoundland to british columbia on migration however the area transversed by the species becomes constricted until in the southern part of the united states the occupied area extends from florida to the mouth of the rio grande a distance of only 900 miles still further south the migration path continues to converge and at the latitude of yucatan it is not more than 400 miles wide the great bulk of the species probably moves in a belt less than half this width the scarlet tanager presents another extreme case of a narrowly converging migration route starting from its 1,900-mile-wide breeding range in the eastern deciduous forest 
between new brunswick and saskatchewan as the birds move southward in the fall their path of migration becomes more and more constricted until at the time they leave the united states all are included in the six hundred mile belt from eastern texas to the florida peninsula the boundaries continue to converge to less than one hundred miles through honduras and costa rica the species winters in the heavily forested areas of northwestern south america including parts of colombia ecuador and peru the rose-breasted grosbeak also leaves the united states through the six hundred mile stretch from eastern texas to apalachicola bay but thereafter this grosbeak crosses the gulf of mexico and enters the northern part of its winter quarters in southern mexico and these lines do not converge however the pathway of those individuals that continue to south america is considerably constricted by the narrowing of land through central america although the cases cited represent extremes of convergence a narrowing of migratory paths is the rule for the majority of north american birds both the shape of the continent and major habitat belts tend to constrict southward movement so that the width of the migration route in the latitude of the gulf of mexico is much less than in the breeding range the american red start represents a case of a wide migration route but even in the southern united states this path is still much narrower than the breeding range these birds however cross all of the gulf of mexico and pass from florida to cuba and haiti by way of the bahamas so that here their route is about two thousand five hundred miles wide principal routes from north america w w cook identified seven generalized routes for birds leaving the united states on their way to various wintering grounds the routes by which birds return northward in the spring are not as well known atlantic oceanic route route number one is primarily oceanic and passes directly over the atlantic ocean from labrador and nova scotia to the lesser antilles then through this group of small islands to the mainland of south america most of the adult american golden plovers and some other shorebirds use this as their fall route these plovers may accomplish the whole two thousand four hundred miles without pause and in fair weather the flocks pass bermuda and sometimes even the islands of antilles without stopping as mentioned previously radar has indicated strong fall movements of warblers from the new england coast out over the atlantic to points south along this route one of these the black pole warbler has evolved a high level metabolic efficiency in order to make this extended over water passage this species loses only 0.06 percent of its weight per hour essentially water and fat compared to thrushes warblers and sparrows on overland routes which lose 1.2 percent of their weight per hour of flight since this route lies almost entirely over the sea it is definitely known only at its terminals and from occasional observations made on bermuda and other islands along its course some of the shorebirds that breed on the arctic tundra of the district of mackenzie northwest territories and alaska fly southeastward across canada to the atlantic coast and finally follow this oceanic route to the mainland of south america although most birds make their migratory flights either by day or by night birds using this route fly both day and night 
the arctic churn follows the atlantic ocean route chiefly along the eastern side of the ocean in the eastern hemisphere likewise vast numbers of seabirds such as ox muirs guillemots phalaropes jagers petrels and shearwaters follow this over water route from breeding sites along coasts and on islands in the northern and southern hemispheres atlantic coast route and tributaries the atlantic coast is a regular avenue of travel and is well known for many famous locations for observing both land and water birds about fifty different kinds of land birds that breed in new england follow the coast southward to florida and travel thence by island and mainland to south america the map indicates a natural and convenient highway through the bahamas cuba hispaniola puerto rico and the lesser antilles to the south american coast resting places are provided at convenient intervals and at no time are these aerial travelers out of sight of land it is not however the favored highway only about twenty five species of birds go beyond cuba to puerto rico along this route to their winter quarters while only six species are known to travel to south america by way of the lesser antilles many thousands of american coots and american widgeons northern pintails blue-winged teals and other waterfowl as well as shore birds regularly spend the winter season in the coastal marshes inland lakes and ponds of cuba hispaniola and puerto rico route number three is a direct line of travel for atlantic coast migrants en route to south america although it involves much longer flights it is used almost entirely by land birds after taking off from the coast of florida there are only two intermediate land masses where migrants might pause for rest and food nevertheless tens of thousands of birds of about sixty species cross the one hundred fifty miles from florida to cuba where many remain for the winter months the others negotiate the ninety miles between cuba and jamaica but from that point to the south american coast there is a stretch of islandless ocean five hundred miles across the bobolink so far outnumbers all other birds using this path that this route could be designated the bobolink route as traveling companions along this route the bobolink may meet vireos kingbirds and common nighthawks from florida chuck wills widows from the southeastern states black billed and yellow billed cuckoos from new england gray cheek thrushes from quebec bank swallows from labrador and black pole warblers from alaska sometimes this scattered assemblage will be joined by a tanager or a wood thrush but the bobolink route is not used by the greatest number of migrants formerly it was thought most north american land birds migrated to central america via the florida coast then crossed to cuba and finally made the short flight from the western tip of cuba to yucatan a glance at the map would suggest this as a most natural route but as a matter of fact it is practically deserted except for a few swallows and shore birds or an occasional land bird storm driven from its normal course what actually happens in the fall is that many of the birds breeding east of the appalachian mountains travel parallel to the seacoast in a more or less southwesterly direction and maintaining this same general course from northwestern florida cross the gulf of mexico to the coastal regions of eastern mexico they thus join migrants from further inland in using route number four routes used by brant 
in eastern north america merit some detail because their flight paths were long misunderstood these birds winter on the atlantic coast chiefly at barnegat bay new jersey but depending upon the severity of the season and the food available many winter south to north carolina their breeding grounds are in the canadian arctic archipelago and on the coasts of greenland careful studies have shown that the main body travels northward in spring along the coast to the bay of fundy overland to northumberland strait which separates prince edward island from mainland new brunswick and nova scotia a minor route appears to lead northward from long island sound by way of the housatannic and connecticut river valleys to the st lawrence river after spending the entire month of may feeding and resting in the gulf of st lawrence the eastern segment of the brant population resumes its journey by departing overland from the bay of seven island area flying almost due north to ungave bay and from there to nesting grounds probably on baffin island and greenland a smaller segment travels a route slightly north of west to the southeastern shores of james bay although east of that area some of the flocks take a more northwesterly course by descending the fort george river to reach the eastern shore of james bay upon their arrival at either of these two points on james bay the brants of this western segment turn northward and proceed along eastern hudson bay to their breeding grounds in the canadian arctic the fall migration of brant follows the routes utilized in the spring during this season the eastern population appears only on the western and southern shores of ungave bay before continuing their southward journey to the gulf of st lawrence and beyond most of the birds of the western segment instead of following the eastern shores of hudson and james bays turn southwestward across the former by way of the belcher islands to cape henrietta maria and from there south along the western shore of james bay by way of akimiski and charlton islands at the southern end of james bay they are joined by those that have taken the more direct route along the east coasts of the bays and all then fly overland five hundred and seventy miles to the estuary of the st lawrence river the atlantic coast wintering area receives waterfowl from three or four interior migration paths one of which is of primary importance as it includes great flocks of canvasbacks redheads greater and lesser scalp canada geese and many american black ducks that winter in the waters and marshes of the coastal region south of delaware bay the canvasbacks redheads and scalp coming from breeding grounds on the great northern plains of central canada follow the general southeasterly trend of the great lakes across pennsylvania over the mountains and reach the atlantic coast in the vicinity of delaware and chesapeake bays american black ducks mallards and blue-winged teals that have gathered in southern ontario during the fall leave these feeding grounds and proceed southwest many continue this route down the ohio valley but others upon reaching the vicinity of st Clair flats between michigan and ontario swing abruptly to the southeast and cross the mountains to reach the atlantic coast south of new jersey this route with its mississippi valley branch has been fully documented by the recovery records of ducks banded at lake scugog ontario canvasbacks migrate from the prairie pothole region of the central united states and canada to many wintering areas in the united states this duck has been the subject of careful study and its principal migration routes based on recovery of banded birds have been shown these principal routes travel from the major breeding area 
in the prairie provinces of canada and the northern prairies of the united states southeastward through the southern great lakes area to chesapeake bay the chief wintering area relatively few canvasbacks proceed southward along the atlantic seaboard a less important route extends off from the main trunk in the southern minnesota region and goes south along the mississippi valley to points along the river other individuals of the prairie breeding population fly southward on a broad front to the gulf coast of texas and the interior of mexico while some proceed southwestward on a relatively broad path to the northern pacific coast mackenzie valley great lakes mississippi valley routes and tributaries the migration route extending from the mackenzie valley past the great lakes and down the mississippi valley is the longest of any in the western hemisphere its northern terminus is on the arctic coast in the regions of kotzebue sound alaska and on the mouth of the mackenzie river while its southern end lies in argentina for more than three thousand miles from the mouth of the mackenzie to the delta of the mississippi this route is uninterrupted by mountains in fact the greatest elevation above sea level is less than two thousand feet because it is well timbered and watered the entire region offers ideal conditions for its great hosts of migrating birds it is followed by such vast numbers of ducks geese shorebirds blackbirds sparrows warblers and thrushes that observers stationed at favorable points in the mississippi valley during the height of migration can see large numbers of many species when many of these species including ducks geese american robins and yellow rumped warblers arrive at the gulf coast they spread out east and west for their winter sojourn others despite the perils of a trip involving a flight of several hundred miles across the gulf of mexico fly straight for central and south america this part of the route is a broad boulevard extending from northwestern florida to eastern texas and southward across the gulf of mexico to yucatan and the isthmus of tehuantepec this route appears to be preferred over the safer but more circuitous land or island routes by way of texas or florida during the height of migration some of the islands off the coast of louisiana are rewarding observation points for the student of birds since the feathered travelers literally swarm over them present detailed knowledge of the chief tributaries to the mackenzie great lakes mississippi valley route relates primarily to waterfowl reference has been made already to the flight of american black ducks that reach the mississippi valley from southern ontario some individuals of this species banded at lake scugog ontario have been recaptured in succeeding seasons in wisconsin and manitoba but the majority was retaken at points south of the junction of the ohio river with the mississippi indicating their main route of travel from southern ontario a second route that joins the main artery on its eastern side is the one used by eastern populations of snow geese including both blue and white phases that breed mainly on southampton island and in the fox basin of baffin island in the fall these geese work southward along the shores of hudson bay and upon reaching the southern extremity of james bay take off on their flight to the great coastal marshes of louisiana and texas west of the mississippi river delta great plains rocky mountain routes this route also has its origin in the mackenzie river delta and alaska the sand hill cranes white fronted geese and smaller races of the canada goose follow this route through the great plains from breeding areas in alaska and western canada 
it is used chiefly by the northern pintails and american widgeons that fly southward through eastern alberta to western montana some localities in this area as for example the national bison range at moise montana normally furnish food in such abundance that these birds are induced to pause in their migratory movement some flocks of pintails and widgeons move from this area almost directly west across idaho to the valley of the columbia river then south to the interior valleys of california others leave montana by traveling southeastward across wyoming and colorado to join other flocks moving southward through the great plains observations made in the vicinity of corpus christi texas have shown one of the shortcuts from the coastal bend of texas to the shore of the bay of campeche that is part of the great artery of migration thousands of birds pass along the coast to the northern part of veracruz mexico since coastal areas in tamaulipas to the north are arid and unsuitable for the denizens of moist woodlands it is probable that much if not all of this part of the route for these species is a short distance offshore it is used by such woodland species as the golden winged worm eating and kentucky warblers pacific coast route although it does present features of unusual interest the pacific coast route is not as long or heavily traveled as some of the others described because of the equitable conditions that prevail many species of birds breeding along the coast from the northwestern states to southeastern alaska either do not migrate or else make relatively short journeys this route has its origin chiefly in western alaska around the yukon river delta some of the scoters and other sea ducks of the north pacific region as well as the diminutive crackling canada goose of the yukon river delta use the coastal sea route for all or most of their southward flight large numbers of arctic breeding shorebirds also use this route the journey of the canada goose as shown by return records from birds banded at hooper bay alaska has been traced southward across the alaskan peninsula and apparently across the gulf of alaska to the queen charlotte islands the birds then follow the coastline south to near the mouth of the columbia river where the route swings toward the interior for a short distance before continuing south by way of the willamette river valley the winter quarters of this subspecies of canada goose are chiefly in the vicinity of tool lake on the oregon california line and in the sacramento valley of california although a few push on to the san joaquin valley a tributary of this flyway is followed by ross's goose which breeds in the Perry River District south of Queen Maud Gulf and other areas further east on the central Arctic coast of Canada. Its fall migration is southwest and south across the barren grounds to Great Slave and Athabasca Lakes, where it joins thousands of other waterfowl bound for winter homes along the eastern coast of the United States and the Gulf of Mexico but when ross's geese have traveled south approximately to the northern boundary of montana most of them separate from their companions and turn southwest across the rocky mountains to winter in california in recent years more ross's geese have been found wintering east of the rocky mountains along with flocks of snow geese a change that may be correlated with an eastward extension of their breeding range the southward route of long distance migratory land birds of the pacific area extends chiefly through the interior of california to the mouth of the colorado river and on to winter quarters in western mexico the movements of the western tanager show a migration route 
that is in some ways remarkable this species breeds in the mountains from the northern part of baja california and western texas north to northern british columbia and the southwestern borders of the mackenzie river its winter range is in two discontinuous areas southern baja california and eastern and southwestern mexico south to guatemala during spring migration the birds appear first in western texas and the southern part of new mexico and arizona about april twentieth by april thirtieth the vanguard has advanced evenly to an approximate east-west line across central new mexico arizona and southern california by may tenth the easternmost birds have advanced only to southern colorado while those in the far west have reached northern washington ten days later the northward advance of this species is shown as a great curve extending northeastward from vancouver island to central alberta and thence southeastward to northern colorado since these tanagers do not reach northern colorado until may twentieth it is evident these present in alberta on that date actually reached there by a route that carried them west of the rockies to southern british columbia and thence eastward along the still snowy northern rocky mountains pacific oceanic route the pacific oceanic route is used by pacific golden plovers bristle-fied curlews ruddy turnstones wandering tattlers and other shorebirds the ruddy turnstones migrating from the islands in the bering sea have an elliptical route that takes them southward through the islands of the central pacific and northward along the asiatic coast in addition many seabirds that breed in the far northern coasts as well as on southern coasts and islands migrate across the pacific well away from land except when the breeding season approaches the pacific golden plover breeds chiefly along the arctic coast of siberia and in limited areas of the alaskan coast some of the birds probably migrate south through asia to winter quarters in japan china india australia new zealand and the islands of oceania others go south across the pacific to hawaii and other islands in the central and southern pacific migrating golden plovers have been observed at sea on a line that extends from the aleutian islands to hawaii while it seems incredible that any birds could lay a course so accurately as to make landfall on these small isolated oceanic islands two thousand miles south of the aleutians two thousand miles west of baja california and nearly four thousand miles from japan year after year pacific golden plovers make this transoceanic round trip arctic routes some arctic nesting birds retreat only a short distance south in winter these species include the red-legged kittiwake ross's gull emperor goose and eiders this latter group of ducks winter well south of their nesting area but nevertheless remain further north than do other ducks the routes followed by these birds are chiefly parallel to the coast and may be considered as being tributary either to the atlantic or pacific coast routes the heavy passage of gulls ducks and brants at point barrow and other points on the arctic coast has been noted by many observers the best defined arctic route in north america follows the coast of alaska a migration route therefore may be anything from a narrow path closely adhering to a geographic feature such as a river valley or coastline to a broad avenue that leads in the desired direction and follows only the general pattern of the land mass oceanic routes appear to be special cases that are not fully understood also it must be remembered that all the main routes contain a multitude of tributary and separate minor routes 
in fact with the entire continent of north america crossed by migratory birds the different groups or species frequently follow lines that may repeatedly intersect those taken by others of their own kind or by other species the arterial or trunk roots therefore must be considered merely as indicating paths of migration on which concentration of birds is more noticeable. End of chapter 15